comes in for me. I've got most of 15 minutes to fill if need be, so Q&A could get interesting or you might get out for a cup of coffee early. Um, it's nice to be back at LCA again. Always enjoy coming here every year. Um, my name's Stephen Ellis. I now work for Red Hat in our new New Zealand office. And I'm here to talk to you today about a topic that comes up time and time and again at LCA. But rather than taking... One thing I thought about is where I come from, how I interact with Linux systems day to day. A lot of my background is operational, sysadmin, um, kind of real implementation hands-on. So one thing we want to cover off is you know, a, an overview of SE Linux and how you should be using it, because you really should be using it. And also, one thing with it is, well, it's great if we approach it from a Greenfields perspective, but you know, how can you go and retrofit it to existing systems? How should you be using this in the real world? But I, thought, I really need to talk about what this is not. So that way I can get rid of a whole bunch of the audience really early on and the rest of us can just get down to the, the, the interesting bits. So it's not about the code. Is Russell in the room? One of my eponymous colleagues who asks us around a lot with SE Linux. If you really want to know a lot about SE Linux, there's a lot of guys who know the down and dirty code. That's not me. I am an ex-developer. I, I quite enjoy looking at these sorts of things occasionally. Don't know why. But it's not about the code. And we're not here to have a flame war, guys. If you're a really big fan of App Armor or you're, or you're into Smack, and I'm talking Smack in a Linux sense, please, you know, uh, we're not here to discuss those things. At the end of the day, most of the distributions ship SE Linux in some form today. It's extremely widely available. In fact, if you've been reading some of the postings over the last week, you notice that the NSA has even ported SE Linux over to Android, which is going to make some very interesting um, stories over the next few, few years. Um, so we're here to keep it real. I'm not talking about some fluffy MTV sense of, you know, the, the real world. We're talking here about how we really want to use it. And so, first, what do you do? What's the first thing everybody in the room does when they approach a system with SE Linux? Turn it off. Turn it off, of course. Yay. Why do you turn it off? Come on. I'm scared of it. Scared? Yeah, come on. Too hard. Too hard. Ooh. What else? Because, because you have custom uh, applications which would require developing very uh, extensive uh, modules. Or the ISV. I rooted the box and I was annoyed by it. Annoyed by it, yeah. <laughs> One of the most common reasons in business simply comes down to this. The install notes told you to turn it off. And you know, this is the first thing that showed up. It was in my top five when I looked at, you know, SE Linux install notes. Yay. Guess what? Permissive is not on. At best, permissive is there for testing. If you're going to use SE Linux, it needs to be enabled and enforcing. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time, right? And how can we do that? You know, if, if Wally's happy to have SE Linux turned on on his boxes, why aren't you guys? Now, part of it comes down to policy. And we're not talking about, you know, government-centric, sitting in circles, discussing policy. The core of SE Linux is it has to give you policies. If the policies aren't good enough, then you're going to have to come up with your own. And that just starts to make it that bit easier. That bit harder. Yeah, it's not easy. But it might be. So what do we do about it? Or what is SE Linux? So how many have sat in SE Linux sessions at LCA and other, thing, other conferences before? A few of you. How many people know of the history of SE Linux? Where it's come from? Is there... So a lot of this you'll know about, you know, it's been around for quite a long time and it's been in a lot of the distributions for a long time. And it's been turned off for an awful long time. Or at best in permissive mode for a long time. And I'm sure I've just missed some slides somewhere. So, um, yeah, it, it, created by the NSA, currently maintained by a group amongst which Red Hat is very heavily involved. 
uh, made available under the GNU public license and now available for your Android cell phone. So what is SE Linux about? Mac versus DAC. What's Mac? It's mandatory. Correct. Versus discretionary. discretionary. Very, very important. Um, labeling is a key part of this. We'll, do, we'll cover that in a little bit of detail. Uh, and about type enforcement and policy. So the key thing here is the difference between a conventional Unix Linux type environment with discretionary access. You know, if you set a permission, permission set. You know, if you want everyone to get, you know, right access to your home directory, you can quite freely go and do that. Um, the worst part about DAC is root can do pretty much anything. So you root a box, you own the box. And there's nothing preventing, you know, misfile permissions allowing a uh, compromised application reading and writing to random parts of your file system that you really don't want them to play in. So, Mac, mandatory access control. So, it doesn't matter how you set your permissions. If Apache doesn't have access to your home directory at a Mac level, it will never be able to read your public HTML folder to go in and access you know, your personal website or do other things. You know, it's a lot more explicit, a lot more fine-grained control. And it can be incredibly fine-grained right down to, you know, which ports a process is allowed access to. Um, memory, sockets, you know, we've got a lot of control here. And that's all very well and good, but you know, what happens if we've got no policy? We've got nothing to tell us what, we, what these applications should be doing. And historically, a lot of these policies were minimal at best. So guess what? We all turn it off. Under the hood, a lot of this then comes down to the labeling. Um, so your directories, your files, your devices, your sockets will have SE Linux labels associated with them. So here's the really simple example, and we'll keep coming back through this to Apache. Um, partially because it's, it's so uh, prevalent, partially because it's a really good example to just go away and play with. If you're going to do something at first, go and harden your web server. And partially because it's one of the things that you tend to see more, some of the most security uh, issues with, aside from things like Flash and Firefox, but we're, we're talking about real enterprise world here, not your, your desktop. Um, so it's really important that we have a really strong, hardened web server environment. Everything that you can do here, you can then learn, reuse on other applications and services. So the binary has a context associated with it to indicate that it's Apache or your HTTPD server. This could be, you know, insert your favorite HTTP server of choice here. In this case, what we're talking about Apache. Um, your uh, configuration location, etc, httpd, has permissions associated with it so that Apache can get to its config files. Likewise, your dock root has the right permissions so that it can serve up the content. Uh, again, the last one is simply var log httpd has a different context simply assigned so that it's allowed to write to that location in order to do its logging. Um, uh, some other base standard um, uh, configure um, labels here around the, the modules location and in the case of a lot of environments, you know, the init file that allows it to be started up to execute. So once you start up Apache in a properly managed SE Linux so, uh, Linux environment, it will then come up with that label. And it can now then be associated with all the other HTTPD labels on the system. It knows what it does and doesn't have access to. And similarly, the HTTP ports have an appropriate label associated. So you can't go and have your Apache uh, server routed and go into me to listen on a non-standard port. Because it's, this is mandatory. This is all you can do. So the labels are effectively used to enforce all those policies. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other fields around, you know, the system user and, and generic users on the box. 
and then the enforcement is how these policies should be applied. So policies, it's just a rule set. Um, if you're getting to the point where you're playing with MLS, MCS, this is really cool sexy stuff, please come back next year and tell us all about it. I, I tried to read up on this, my ears started to bleed. Um, it starts getting quite complex. If you're really hard on security, no, you're really worried about you know, the whole common criteria, security policies and so on, uh, the, the whole MLS uh, spec is really getting quite interesting here. But most systems, all you're doing is we're living within this targeted world. And that's the type of policies that are applied. So, unless something's covered by the targeted policy, it runs, a, poli a process runs unconfirmed, which effectively means it can do bugger all. On a modern distribution, in theory, all the apps that are coming in from your vendor should have a policy associated with it, or your Linux distribution, in theory. Sadly, that's not always the case, and it's something I hit when I tried to um, retrofit an old system to make it fully SE Linux hardened. So part of it is, well, why the hell am I going to use it? You know, we're all saying we keep having to turn it off. It just doesn't do what we want. Part of the point should be today is where should we be using it? And the fact if it's easy enough for Wally to use it, you should be using it everywhere. Right? This isn't optional. This should be mandatory. And why don't you? Well, usually it's because you don't know how to use it. Or you don't know how easy it is now with the tools that you're shipping on your typical distribution to actually manage this, to enable it, to tweak it, to tune it, to debug it. Very much so to debug it. Because no matter what you do with the policies you've got, distributed with the system, you're bound to set off an SE Linux alert at some point. So you do need to know how to understand those messages, how to react appropriately. Because it's very easy to go and put a bad policy on your system and either lock yourself out or make the, the, the problem worse by effectively opening up all access rather than controlling the type of access that your applications and services should have. So in the beginning, we turn it on. Not permissive. That would be set in for zero. We want it on. We want it enforcing. We want the alarms going off. We want to actually make our life a little bit more painful because that way we will actually go and fix the problems. For approximately the last year on my laptop, I've run Fedora with SE Linux fully enforced. Uh, all the demos and environments I'm building with customers in New Zealand, uh, all the environments I'm standing up, I'm actually building from scratch, SE Linux enforced. Okay, it's easier. These are green fields. Um, what I've typically found is if the alarms are going off, I'm doing something wrong. I'm thinking about the systems in an old-fashioned way. I'm putting files in locations that I shouldn't be anymore because they don't live within the policy. Or it's a bad vendor. It's a bad ISV. It's hopefully someone else's fault. So, okay, we've got it on. Let's make sure it is on. Get in force. Yay, we're on. Um, most of you today running Linux on your laptops. Log in, do get in force. It'll probably come up permissive. There's very few distros that will ship today without some SE Linux if you do a vanilla install. Then go and check that on boot it's going to re enable. Uh, yeah, you can go and, if, if things all go to poo, go and turn it off in grub, so you make sure that it doesn't come on when you reboot. If you've actually gone and really hard locked yourself out of a box. But for the most part, this is where you should be. When you reboot the box, we want it to always come up enforcing. That's what we've done. Now we have to make sure that the file system actually is all present and correct. So, fix files on boot. We'll actually go and put a little file in the root file system to tell it to go and relabel. Um, I have not played with SE Linux on things like Butter. 
uh, as anyone here, or other more interesting and esoteric file systems. Uh, works fine on XFS, most forms of uh, EXT, and so forth. So we're going to do a reboot. Um, if you're sitting on a few terabytes of data, this may take some time while it goes and traverses the structure and make sure all your, your labels are correct. Um, these are the commands I always kept forgetting. And I kept forgetting it's really easy. It's just minus Z. Minus Z just tells you everything about what SE Linux is doing. You want to look at the, the, the context, the label associated with the particular application. PS minus Z. You want to go and look at the context associated with some files, LS minus Z. Right? Just remember. Uh, I almost wish that the name had a Z in it, Z E Linux or something. You know, I'd, I'd remember it better. Just minus Z, you're going to be okay. The point is that the SE Linux aware apps, you can go and play, manage, tweak your. Um, um, your labels. One big gotcha. New files inherit, move files keep. It's a common gotcha when you're moving things around in your file system is that you end up with incorrect labels in a particular place. Because you're playing in a temporary area and you move to your final production deployment area. The files aren't being served up by your web server, they aren't being picked up by your application server, wherever it may be. It's because you've done a move they haven't picked up the correct labels for the lo new location. So, what does it mean when I get a error? Well, it means something's wrong. Of course, it's an error. So what can the error be? Well, the labeling could be wrong. Uh, the policy might need a tweak because we're doing something in a particular way. We, 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 need, we, we may be developing our user policy. There's a bug or usually the upstream vendor has delivered you a bad policy, please go and beat them up, or work closely with your Linux distributor to go and beat them up. Or it really is something's gone wrong. Now, if you're running it in permissive, let's say permissive is there for testing. Permissive won't, um, you know, unless you're doing some really good log analysis, you won't really know what's going on when it's just running in permissive mode. You know, how many of you go and check your log files to go and look what interesting alarms SE Linux has pumped out lately in permissive mode. How many? Ooh, one. Wow. Permissive mode will not save your ass. It will not, I guarantee you, save your ass in the real world. No. Even if you're running your system on Linux, permissive mode will not do you many favors. You need it turned on. So, typical environment. How do we go wrong? How do we debug it? What are the got little gotchas? So we're going to create a little file that we want to go and serve up by our web server and we go and dump it into our doc root. That's it. Doesn't show up. So what's your normal troubleshooting? If you're going to debug Apache, what's the first thing you look at? Yeah. We've done a move, not a copy. That's the issue here. You know, we should look in Varlog. HTTPD access, errors, you know. The fact is that this object right now is still owned by a user. HTTP, um, Apache just won't be able to access it. We need to change the context associated with that file. Now, there's a number of ways of doing it. The sim hardest way, which is why everyone feels this is difficult, what we can go and look at what a context should be, you know, in the, in the real uh, uh, files that we know Apache has access to. And then we can just use Chicon to go and set the same permissions on our file. And yay, everything's good. And yay, we can go and see our beautiful, beautiful web page. Isn't that great? Bit easier. We can actually use the same command, but with minus minus reference. And if you're going to do a tree, you can just do, you know, recursive as well, and apply the policy. Or apply the, the, the same set of labels to the files. Easiest way. The policy defines that Apache in varwhtml, all files should be tagged with that context. 
So just get it to go and relabel. Just go and get it to fix itself. Easy peasy. That's providing the policy exists. Far less to worry about. All right, next. We're going to turn on access because, you know, the, 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 the guys you know, like to go and serve up their own little private websites, so we'll go and allow them to go and use the public HTML area. And, you know, in a standard um, Linux way, we'd just go and fix the HTTPD conf to go and allow access to public HTML, just do uh, DAC style permissions to give the Apache process read access into the user's um, home, pull, public HTML directory. Um, reload Apache, just create your file, away we go, and um, no. So as we said earlier, what do we need to check? Well, we'll go and look in the usual places. We'll look at the access log, we'll look at the error log. They're not going to tell us anything other than the fact we can't set the file up. So where do we go next? Well, with look, you might look at file log messages. If you're going to be really antsy about it, you just go and turn SC Linux off and then forget about it because it works. So we're going to check file log messages and we've got a few errors happening. This is where the tools are now getting really good. We've got an error, so we use SC alert on the UUID of the error. Hey, great, documentation, telling me what to do, what to fix. Please, though, be careful, there may be dragons. Make sure you do understand what you're trying to fix here. You know, don't just go and apply the recommendations. And remember, these are just recommendations. You know, if it turns out that you're going to go and give Apache rewrite access to dev Cayman, it's really not a good idea. You know, actually consider the context within which you're working. So this is saying, there's a bool I need to apply to enable Apache to access home directories. Someone's already worked all this stuff out for us. Great. And documented it. So there's all the additional information that's come out from analyzing that particular uh, SE Linux alert and the raw messages out of your file log uh, messages. So we'll go and apply it. Yay! Awesome. So we've got these booleans, get bool, set bool, which will tell us about various values, various optional things that we can enable that will typically default to a nice hardened off state. So uh, dependent on your distro and the set of policies shipped or where the SE Linux policy set has got at the moment, this list will vary. Get it, SE bool minus they will just simply list all of them for you. Um, so where's a couple of interesting ones? Uh, well, Coro Sync Rewrite TempFS. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Mod auth NTLM WinBind is set to off. You know, if you've got various authentication issues. Yeah. Um, here's one we'll come back to earlier. HTTPD enable CGI. And this machine is actually set to on. Most cases it'll be set to off. You wonder why your CGI scripts aren't working? There's a Boolean to go and turn it on. Uh, there's a simple set, you know, if you um, for example, serving files up over NFS from your web server. HTTPD use NFS defaults to off. So you'll have issues looking at these errors. All you will notice is that there is a non-access issue. If you actually look at the directory path, look at the permissions, you'll think, well, what's wrong here? That path is either owned by Apache or it's got the correct permissions. It's got world read, world, world read access. No, that's off. Game over. If you want to see what booleans have been set, um, again, some of this may be distro dependent, but that's typical where, typically where, just, look, just, just do locate booleans.local and you'll find out what your local values are. When in doubt when debugging a system or debugging a tree, restore the labels. Though that can trip you up, because if you've been going in and just setting custom uh, SE Linux labels, if 
you do a restore, they will be set back to the default values as set by the policy for that location on the file system. It's a great way to get things back to a semi-sane state when you've been messing around. So here we do uh, restore con on the user's home directory. And in this particular case, um, I'll read it up there. It's actually got a policy defined so that the public HTML directory will actually be applied with the correct HTTPD SE Linux label so that all the accesses are, are as appropriate. Early on in the game, I highly recommend you install Audit, Audit D. Uh, that moves a lot of the messages off into their own log. It's a lot easier to analyze and see what's going on. And you don't have other admins going, why am I seeing all this SE Linux lab in, uh, crap in Varlog messages? A great tool, at least on Fedora and RHEL, doesn't appear to be on Debian, for some reason it was some time ago and got pulled, as uh, SE Troubleshoot. Uh, and also SE Alert minus A, well that will go and audit everything in your var log, audit, audit.log, and give you some feedback in terms of what, what alerts have been happening recently and what remedial action you should be taking. So this is all well and good when we're actually you know, building a system from scratch. We can take our time. We can run the system initially in permissive mode, see what alerts go off, or if need be, because it isn't out there in the real world, isn't being used by customers, by be it internal or external. We don't need to um, worry about the alerts that are going to be raised when we go and put it into enforcing mode and force ourselves to fix the issues. But how easy is it to just go and retrofit SE Linux to your existing production environment? Well, one nice thing is if we want to go and retrofit, we can do it in permissive mode initially. There won't be an impact to the frontline users. We'll see the alerts. We could leave it on for a week. We can see what's really happening and start to take remedial action. Now, I've got my own little personal web server. It runs as a Zen-based VM simply because my you know, server hardware at home uh, is not capable of running with uh, hardware accelerated extensions. The, the replacement hardware is there. It's been there for some time. Finding the time to do the swap and switch and so forth is always fun. But it's been rock solid. In fact, for a long time it was, I believe I first said it with Debian Sarge. One reason it's Debian is this was originally a very memory constrained environment and you'll notice I'm running this website with 96 mega RAM and a one and a half gigabyte disk. In fact, when it was Sarge, it was actually a one gigabyte virtual disk. It's tiny, but it was enough to store our personal photos, our personal website, other bits and pieces. I'd taken the approach that this might be hacked. So I kept it nice and small, fairly simple. Images are being stored somewhere over NFS, only has read-only access, you know, sufficient network controls around it. If it ever did get compromised, I've got a backup of the VM. If need be, I could rebuild this from scratch in an hour or so. It's not difficult to recover from. So I took that approach to security. I've actually had to recover a few things recently, um, be it through corruption or, or, or bad upgrades or other issues, and I was thinking, if this ever gets taken out, do I really want to do this? How, how current is my last backup? And do I really want to go through all the hassle? Would we'll it be much better off hardening it properly, doing the job properly? So I thought, well, rather than this, I'll actually do it properly. But I'll be careful. So what are the steps? Well, of course, I'll do a backup. I'm going to have to do a major upgrade because I really don't want to fart around with the Lenny version of SE Linux. It's a, it's a bit long in the tooth. You know, if, you really wanna, if you're really scared of SE Linux today, odds on you're using it on an older distribution. The more current, the better it's gonna, the experience is going to be. So I'll bring it up to date. To do that, I really needed to increase the size of the VM disk. Um, just downloading the packages alone was probably going to blow out what spare disk I had allocated to that. So there's a little bit of farting around and did the upgrade, did the usual cleanups, made sure that the website's actually working. Took an extra snapshot. 
that's easy now because I've got LVM. They just take a quick snapshot. So I've got something to work from. So if I do go and ask the whole thing up with SE Linux, I know I've got somewhere to roll back to. All right, so I'll put SE Linux on. I'll put Audit D on. I'll see what errors are thrown. We'll see how quickly we can fix it. So in the case of Debian, app get installed, blah, 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 right? Activate it, and that will create the auto relabel. Do a reboot. Goes through, it's nice, it's only like two gigabyte virtual disk now, so relabeling only took seconds. Uh, check the installation, this is a nice little confirmation that if there's something really a bit odd, does a sanity check of your environment. Check the status, yes, we're in permissive mode, we're only testing right now. Uh, my relatives tend to get rather annoyed if they can't look at, uh, well, in particular, my parents get annoyed if they can't look at pictures of their granddaughter, so turning the website off for an extended period while I'm debugging is, is not good karma in my family. So we'll, we'll run this with permissive for now. Right, immediately we start to get errors going off because I'd always kept my doc root in home, dub, dub, dub. Just the whole way, that's just where I used to keep it. So I need to fix it. So I can just use our good friend Chacon, recursive, reference, pick up the same permissions that Apache would normally have and apply it to home, dub, dub, dub. Great. Except that's not really a good long-term thing. If I go and you know, apply new files in that area, they won't pick up that context. What I really need to do is update my policy. So in this case, the top line will simply say that everything in home dub 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 will pick up the correct uh, HTTP content policy um, label. That's all good. The second trick was to apply the CGI bin label in there as well. Because I've actually got a little script that goes and does smart things with the photographs in its local CGI bin. I then use RestoreCon to apply that and this will now continue thereafter and any new files created in either of the locations will pick up the correct permissions moving forward. Wasn't quite enough though. Our friend SE Manage, we needed to apply that boolean, turn CGI on. So we still get another alerts going on. And the last thing was HTTPD use on NFS. So that was where we had all my photos are off on this NFS share. I need to allow access. What was the hardest part in the whole retrofitting? Everything other than applying the S and debugging SE Linux. It took me far longer to do the backups, to do the upgrades, to get the environment ready, to make sure I was actually happy to go ahead with doing, applying SE Linux to this. Now, okay, this is quite a simple, well-defined thing, Apache. But the fact is that the policies are well defined. The tools are actually quite simple to use now. You got audit D there, the logs are relatively easy to analyze. So this server now is running actually enforcing. It's doing its job properly. And if I actually start to see entries in audit D, I know something's wrong. I know I need to take action. And with luck, it's not my fault. There is something happening that I need to take action about. Uh, I'll just skip forward and come back. Key documentation. One nice thing is that a lot of the Red Hat's documentations are under, uh, often under Creative Commons licenses as well. There's some really good docs there uh, around using SE Linux, but this is brilliant. Managing confined services document. It's useful regardless of what distribution you're playing with, but it's got guidance on how to apply sensible SE Linux rules to Apache, to MySQL, to Postgres, to Squid, to NFS server. There's a whole raft of applications and services, step-by-step -step guide on how to harden the system. And it actually states in the documentation, if there's something in there they don't have, but you know how to do, let them know. Let this documentation grow. Uh, and a real big thing for me is if your hardware vendors or your ISVs 
or your Linux are not providing you with the kind of policies you need to run these systems properly, if they're telling you to run them in permissive mode, please work with the Linux vendors to try and change this. I'm fed up seeing installation notes saying, run this in permissive mode. Uh, one thing I've noticed recently is that a lot of the HP systems management tools now actually come with a correct, valid SE Linux policy. If your machine is running enforcing, you can install the tools and they work as expected. This is great. This is what we should be seeing. Uh, so let me just jump back. So any questions, queries, uh, pain points? Someone. Up. Yeah, all the, I'll be passing a copy to Simon. So all the references and everything will be available. And, and apologies to a few of the guys at Red Hat because a couple of the debugging notes I stole off there. So you just said um, software's coming with appropriate policy. The implication is that packages you install can change your policy on your system automatically. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> um, as part of installing the package, it should come with a policy for itself. It shouldn't be able to override a policy for another application or service. Uh, yet, if, if, if uh, you go and install an application from a vendor that decides to give themselves rewrite access to some godforsaken um, an inappropriate area, then the, these are things that should be reported through back through the SE Linux community and back through the Linux vendors, and then we can go after the uh, particular. Uh, application vendor with a sharp pointy stick. I'll just repeat. Well, uh, I think the hardest part is to uh, create a new policy for custom software that you write. Yeah, so I was just, yeah, the, this is quite common. The, the, the trick here is if it's your software, you know, it's writing the policy from scratch. And how do you work through that? Um, the documentation's getting much better around it. Uh, really, I've not tried it myself. Uh, most of what I'm dealing with is where it's either an existing application or service from a, a vendor, or it's running on top of a middleware stack, which is the bit we have to worry about, rather than having to develop a policy from scratch. Will SE Linux override local file permissions in a directory, or do the file permissions still stand true? So if you deny a user access to a directory and the application's running as that user, yeah. but the SE Linux policy is permissive, will file system permissions still prevent that, that application from accessing that directory? Right, did everyone pick up on that? Uh, I can probably summarise it. If you've used DAC, to exclude Apache from accessing your public HTML folder, it will still not access it even if it's got the correct SE Linux permissions. So you end up with kind of a union. What happens if you have multiple SE Linux policies blocking something? Does it just alert on the first one or all of them? Anyone else can answer that? I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't. It does. Yeah. You have to fix each problem one by one. Yeah. Actually, yes, it does, because when I was debugging the um, CGI bin example, the CGI bin error wouldn't come up until I'd fixed the um, HTTP content label. So if I just jump back to here. The error that showed up that I needed to apply the sys script exec wouldn't show up until I'd fixed sys content. How's um, network policy coming along? Because I know there was work going on to implement that. Network policy in what regard? Restricting, huh. restricting where and if. I don't know. Packets um, oh, I haven't looked at that. Okay. 
Uh, the only bits really looked at at the moment are things around uh, you know, port level access rather than uh, at a TCP IP where and who level. I think one of the most, uh, most interesting areas for me outside of the announcements in the last week around the work with Android is actually the stuff around SVIRT, uh, around you know, being able to containerize your virtual machines as well as container, uh, control access within the virtual machines. You, you, you have referred to uh, website security several times, uh, and I'm just thinking that the majority of um, uh, break-ins uh, are through holes in the scripts, uh, and uh, attackers uh, create some kind of script uh, inside the, the document root, and then access the created file through Apache, uh, and this doesn't protect. For, for, for well, it depends where you want to create the files. All you, if in this case the in the, in the same play, place uh, where the vulnerable, well, vulnerable. Yeah. Well, uh, say you take over the Apache server, you, even if you've got DAC to say that Apache can write to your doc root, your Mac doesn't let you write to the doc root. So it's a guy being, and uh, I, I can write. It's, it, it's running like uh, 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 under the account. Uh, so. Um, yeah, the, the content just lets you read, it won't give you write access. Log will give you write access to the log files. This, the, the top line here, if you compromise the Apache server, you can't write to home dub dub dub. Even if it's got world write, you can't write to home dub dub dub. You can only read from home dub dub dub. You have no write permission. But, but re, uh, uh, real life applications are often create uh, files inside. Temporary files. Yeah, so your policy would define that a given specific location might have write access, or a given specific location might have execute access, might not necessarily have both. Yes, if you have a policy that you're installing some, I don't know, um, bug ticket track it management system that requires read, write, execute access to this piece, then maybe you should be having a conversation with that vendor or with that project that, you know, is this appropriate because it does open up a hole. Uh, can you apply multiple labels to a single directory to allow multiple applications to access that same directory within, so let's say you've got two applications with two separate policies, but they share a common set of files? Um, can you apply multiple labels, or how does that work whereby within SE Linux to allow both of those applications yeah. to access that context? I can't answer that one. I haven't looked at it in enough detail. Um, you know, typically, I'm working within you know, separately isolated areas if we're playing with this stuff. Just create a label that's common to both those Yeah. Yeah, and update manually and update yeah, as well. You just define a new policy with that label. Just jumping back to a bit to uh, writing new policies for software, I believe there's a program called Audit to Allow, which will take yeah. audit logs and make new policies <laughs> from those. Yeah. Of um, course, it's uh, not the best thing. No. Uh, audit to Allow comes under the heading of there may be dragons, okay? It, it's a great way to, to just ad hoc go and allow an awful lot of permissions that you really probably don't want to do. You know, one thing I found when I first put SE Linux used it day to day on the laptop, was OpenVPN wouldn't work. And part of that was simply because where I used to keep my OpenVPN keys was really not a very clever modern place. It was somewhere in my you know, documents directory and so on. So when I moved it to um, tilde slash dot certs, everything behaves. So some, in some cases, think about what you're trying to achieve and are you better off adopting what the policy requires than just simply applying ad hoc rule changes. Is there any kind of uh, clearinghouse for policies? Because I suspect there isn't a snowball's chance in hell that IBM are going to come out with WebSphere policies or Oracle with database policies, but it would be nice not to have to write one in every shop that wants to use SE Linux. 
I think there's some good deal kind of upstream with the whole SE Linux project. Um, there are policy sets coming out from there. So when you check your system, you can see uh, what policy set level you're currently working at in terms of what's been supplied from there. Um, in terms of working with the vendors, yeah, I think that'd be a really good idea. Um, I'd be really keen for interested parties to better motivate the vendors to release proper policies rather than even, I mean, the most detestable case is the extreme SE Linux off. You know, that's just not good in any way, shape, or form. Given, given you can't motivate Oracle to accept running IP tables on the server, <laughs> 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 uh, um, just comment about Oracle and their attitude to security. Sorry, let's move on. Okay, you were talking before about the real world, but unfortunately a lot of people's decision on what to do with SE Linux in the real world is coloured by their experiences on their home installs or their development machines. So if you've got someone, say, pulling a kernel update and they have to relabel their entire file system, or for example, um, the last few Fedora releases have been very good uh, with running SE Linux and enforcing, but anything that's not sponsored or developed by Red Hat still potentially has problems, such as, say, KDE software or Enlightenment software. Um, if these projects are unwilling or unable to um, fix, the pro fix problems themselves or write good policy, at what point should distribution step in and write software even for other people's projects? So write policy, sorry. Well, well, in some cases, the distributions are working closely with the, the projects and trying to work through this. In some cases, it comes down to the community versions of those projects. You know, uh, Ubuntu and Debian and OpenSUSE and Fedora, uh, amongst others, are all strongly committed to helping develop and move forward with those policies. Yes, in some cases, you're going to have. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been playing recently with. Um, oh dear, um, Cinnamon, which is the Linux Mint kind of semi fork of GNOME 3. And, it's yet to throw an error on my box, and it's not really a you know formally supported upstream SE Linux cable. Right, it just seems to work, which is good. Um, but if we day to day don't use it and don't report the issues and don't report the bugs and don't make a fuss, then nothing will change. Um, a couple of questions in permissive mode. Should SC Linux not ever affect anything from Red Hat's perspective? Um, as far as I'm aware. And, and the other one is, um, is Red Hat looking at improving the um, errors so when applications like Apache can't read a file due to SC Linux permissions, it actually says in the Apache log, not just in file log messages? Not to, I, I do not know. Uh, that was one point of showing you the SE audit, SE troubleshoot, and all those other packages. They give you an awful lot of feedback separate. That way we don't have to play with their code. The code doesn't need to worry about providing that feedback. OK, we've got time for about two, one more question. Two more questions. Is there Yeah. Of your policy. And you have no idea where, where, where the policy came from. But it would be nice, for example, for what would be a, like, to port from one system to another system that was actually a file for an application, like most of the directory, right? For which, like, there's a. Well, there's a, the standard policies. I mean, if you do, um, you know, locate Apache.policy or so on, there's, there's a set of standard policies that come. It's part of your SE Linux install, um, and that's like an ever-growing list. Your custom ones will live in a place specific to your flavor of Linux. But what I'm saying is that it's always one file, but it would be nice if there was something like Omicron-D for Apache, for example, from each of all the files that are in the directory. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. It'd be great if there was a way to comment. You know, when you create it, that it was possible to almost push a comment into that file as well, so you knew why you'd done it. I'd love that. I can do that with IP tape rules. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, after the fact, I don't know if you can go in and hand edit the file and go and add in that extra information. I haven't tried that. Be interesting one to play with. I mean, these are things that, uh, you know, conversations you really need to have upstream with the, the, the project. It's good to hear people thinking about this stuff. Uh, sorry. I think we're out of time. Right. We're out of time. All right. Thanks for your time.